Village, where Sean and I take a look at every theatrically released animated film in chronological order. I'm Tenille. And I'm in pain. <laughs> I'm Sean. I did not warn him I was going to do that intro. <laughs> and just the immediate, oh, on his face when I started. Oh, wow. This was... <laughs> A western. Yeah, so we were right. The man from Button Willow sounds like a western title. It was indeed a western. Uh, this is an American made film, obviously. 1965. From 1965. Uh, made by. Uh, who knows? <laughs> I mean, it's distributed by Eagle Films. And I think this is the only movie they've ever made because they don't even have a Wikipedia page. Neat. Yeah. Um. This movie was a bit of a mess. A bit? A bit? Just, just a bit. No, no. Uh, it's... This movie was a complete mess. Like... I would call this movie... Almost a complete disaster. <laughs> oh, why almost? I don't know. You just, don't feel like it's quite a complete disaster? Just no, almost. Because this movie just came off as more of a boring mess as mm -hmm. compared to like actually making me angry that it exists. Is that fair? Yeah, that's fair, although... There are some... There's some problems. Yeah. So, before... Okay. I, I think I'm going to do a brief summary here. Because mm -hmm. your summaries, no offense, I love them, but they tend to get a little wordy. <laughs> okay. I'm going to try and keep this concise. But, essentially, what happens is we've got a setup here at the beginning where... We find out that this movie is going to be about Justin Eagle, the first U.S. government agent to help get land to the government. He gets things done, but not necessarily by the law. I guess. Yeah, he's, he's a paid... He's, he's a cowboy, because he owns a ranch, but he's also like... A spy? A... Bounty hunter? An assassin? Question mark. He works for- A mercenary? For the... Mercenary. That's a word. Mer for yeah, mercenary. that's a good word for him. He's also a mercenary, but you know, like a cowboy mercenary. So it's cool. Question mark. Um, so anyway, he works for the government. And he lives in Button Willow. That's the title of the movie. Yeah, because he's the man from Button Willow. You know, usually when they when a western has like the man something, isn't the appeal of it that like you don't get to know his name? He's just like a stranger or he's the man from blah blah blah, but you like never learn his actual name. I thought that was the purpose of that trope. I don't know. I've never seen a western before this one. That is true. We'll need to talk about that later. Uh <laughs> So anyway, the movie starts off by trying to explain that, like, oh, you know, back with the cowboys and the Indians, the U.S. was trying to build this great railroad from east to west, and wow, isn't that such a cool dream? We're going to ignore the fact about all the terrible things we did in order to achieve this dream, of course, but that's the premise of the film. The film. Mm -hmm. So they set this up, and then just, you know, put a pin in it, we're not going to talk about this for the rest of the movie. Oh, it's like, you forgot one important point. Is like, the government's trying to do this, but these evil ne'er-do-wells are buying up people's lands and then selling it to the government for a profit. Yeah. So the man from Button Willow steps in and stops this from happening. Question mark? Somehow. I don't know, but we put a pin in that plot because then we just need to experience... The life 
Of Justin Eagle. Of Justin Eagle. Who's in the movie for, I would say... Half, if half, that. if that, yeah. Because, no, we got to spend the time, we got to experience the lives of not Mr. Justin Eagle. We need to experience the lives of Sorry and Stormy. We'll get to them. Okay, so I'm going to try and do this quickly. Mm -hmm. That was the setup. But like I said, that's all explained in like the first two minutes. And then we get to the rest of the plot, which is the man from Button Willow, AKA Justin Eagle, coming back to town. And all the ladies are trying to like. He gets marry hit on him. by a woman. Yeah. Because he wants. To, they want to marry him. Because he's just. Oh. He's the main. He's the main character in a western. So dreamy. <laughs> uh. We meet his adopted Chinese daughter, Stormy. We'll get back to that. <laughs> and then, and his hand, his, his cowboy hand. His farm hand named Sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry, too. And then they go to church. I mean, we never see the church. No, but... they walk inside the church. Yeah. And, and then it, they go home. Yeah, and then the rest of the time is kind of spent at his ranch. Mm -hmm. And at his ranch, we're introduced to his horse, Rebel, and his other horse, uh, what's the other horse's name? Girl horse. They sing a song about it. Do they? They, they sing a song where like the entire song is just the name of this girl horse. Oh, you are completely correct. Uh, uh, Savannah? Savannah! Okay. I think that's it. Rebel and Savannah, and he's like, oh, these are great horses, I won them. Oh no, Savannah's sick, call the doctor. Oh wait, she wasn't sick, she had a baby. Because that's the only thing that can happen to horses. As someone who grew up with horses, let me tell you. That is not the only thing that can happen to horses. In an animated movie with horses in it, no one ever expects the horse to be pregnant for some reason. Oh no, our female horse, who we just established is female, and I also have a male horse. What could possibly be the issue, baby? And she gives birth right there. <laughs> well, like, not off screen. on screen, off screen. But like, but oh, no, she then has the a rest, baby. Then the rest of this film is about this baby horse. Yeah. It essentially turns into Bambi. And or spirit before spirit was a thing, obviously. No, I would say Bambi because holy crap, did they rip they, they ripped lot. so much from Bambi? Like, I, I don't want like to say they did this, but I feel like they just like drew over the cells. Well, they obviously couldn't do that. There wasn't like physical copies given out to the public, but like, yeah, there was definitely oh. We watched, like, our team went to go see Bambi. <laughs> 500 times. <laughs> and, you know, or, you know, we just are copying things we remember from Bambi. Because there's, like, points where the horse's legs get all tangled up the exact same way Bambi's does. The little skunk character that's in this movie is trying to, like, do very Thumper-esque things mm -hmm. to, like, help it move around and all that. Is like, it's very, the, very Bambi. This is just Bambi. Um, and then it gets lost. It like it jumps the fence, heads up a mountain. Yeah, there's a whole segment where it thinks it's cool, but it's just a mountain lion behind it. Yeah, where it gets chased by a mountain lion and almost dies, but it's fine. Because it's fine. Because Rebel comes and saves the day. Yeah. And then. Uh, They're fine. And that's the end of that. Yeah. And then we go back to the humans. There's there's another segment where Justin has leaves to leave because the government needs him. And so Stormy and Sorry are singing a song. We've got lots of work to do, to do, to do today. today. Got a lot of work to do today. To oh gosh, the songs in these in this movie. By golly, we got a lot of work to do, to do today. By golly, we got a lot to do today. We've got to catch the river, it's about to run away. And 
keep the fence a-running round the fields of yellow hay. By golly, we got a lot of work to do to do today. By golly, we got a lot to do today. Don't forget, excuse me, I am. Sorry, why you never get married? Me? Get married? Well, I'll tell you, Stormy. I took Gilvary for a buggy ride. <clears throat> Excuse me, ma'am. She sat so pretty by my side. Excuse me, ma'am. I told her how my heart yearned. We hit a bump and overturned. <clears throat> Excuse me, ma'am. I don't know. Trying to. I don't know what song I'm gonna put at the end of this review, but man, is there a just. Sorry is an old farmhand and he sings almost every single song in this movie. Not well. No. Mind you. No, he But just... he sure does sing them. Excuse me, ma'am. Excuse me, ma'am. So they sing a song about that, and then we cut to. Justin actually doing his job. Yeah, which is about, you know, like a 10 minute scene where suddenly the color palette gets all like dark and gritty and he's like fighting pirates or whatever. In Los Angeles. In Los Angeles. And then once he's done with that, the government's like, cool, you can go back to your farm now. So you then we watch- your government the, official. Um, a lot of money. Oh, no, like save the oh, government yeah. official from getting killed official. out at sea because they have to kill him out at sea for some reason. Yeah. Whatever. So they save him, and then the two bad guys that they established earlier in this movie uh, are just taken care of off screen. Yeah. There's no gunfight. No, there's not even a gunfight in a Western. It's like at most... Uh, Justin shoots a couple of cans or like shoots the club out of a card just for the fun of it. Yeah. And then he shoots the light out on the deck of the ship and that's it. Yeah. That's all the gunplay we get in this movie, which is a Western that is animated that they could have done anything they wanted with. That's all we got. I mean, you got to admit though, like when your actor is animated, it makes it a lot less impressive when, you know, he pulls off a shot. <laughs> I mean, it's true, but that also means you can get even more crazy and elaborate because it right. is animated. You could do like, he could do like crazy things. He could do trick shots. Yeah. Round the bend. This isn't based on a real person. Just make him awesome, you know? And then he goes home and it takes like three minutes for him to get home and we watch him go the entire way. And they loop animation that they played at the beginning of the film because it's like the exact he's like it's the exact same scene they're just replaying the animation and now they're singing a song about how he's the man from button willow and it's like i this is the one song i don't remember because it's so generic generic and generic and yet so poorly written that it's like, wait, you went down when you were supposed to obviously go up or something mm -hmm. like that, you know? It's like there was never a res like an upward resolve in any of the song. It yeah. just it kept going down at the end of each phrase. Do 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 do. There's no do 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 or anything. Uh huh. There's no good resolve, and I'm like I'm trying to sing the song and I don't remember it at all. Yeah. And then it ends and he goes home and uh, Stormy and Sari are happy to see him. Yeah, there's the a, there's another scene where they like kick the dog and the skunk out of the house. Oh, and the stupid flying pigeon. Oh yeah, there's a flying pigeon too. Who's a there character. are 12 animal companions it feels like in this movie. There's a lot. It's... Well, there's the three horses, the dog, the skunk, and the pigeon. Oh, and the hen. And the chick, and the rooster. And then the rooster. Oh, and there's just a bunch of other random background animals. Yeah, but like these are actual characters. Yeah, so that's eight, eight. animal characters for yeah. this movie. And the majority of the screen time is spent with them. Mm-hmm. Gah. 
This is not a good movie. No, no, it was not. And that's the plot synopsis. Yeah. So grand total of man comes home, horse is born, horse almost dies, man does job on a pirate ship. Man and that, goes home. Man goes home again. That is the plot of this movie. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. Like, they kind of start off with an interesting premise, albeit they flub it up real hard. It's like the movie realized that it's mo that it was so boring that it had a live actor come in at the very beginning and tells us what the exciting thing is going to be at the end of the movie. At the end of the movie. Yeah. So that people are interested and stay stick around during padding. <laughs> the whole movie is just padding. Uh-huh. Okay, so what do we want to talk about first? Um, well, I, I was kind of going to start to talk about Stormy. Because okay. I, I think that's... That's the biggest issue. That's, that's the elephant in the room. <laughs> so, as you all know, back in the Western times, there was a large immigration of Chinese people to, Which I, the, I, I, to the Americas. I would say, as you may or may not know. Or may, or may not know. Uh... During the Western era, there was a high level of immigration from China specifically, and uh, very often Chinese and African Americans were working on the railroad that was uh, traversing all of the U.S. because that was the thing that was going on at the time. So that is the establishment of why there's a random Chinese girl in this movie. Because Justin was really good friends with her father... And her father's gone now. We don't know if... I, I guess I'm assuming he's dead. he got shot to death. I get, I'm assuming he's dead. Yeah, he's but, dead. He's definitely dead. But, yeah, because Justin says something along the lines of, like, your father's last wish was... He was my best friend. Your father's last wish was to raise for, you like my own. Yeah. Except I won't adopt you because that would be weird. Yeah, he doesn't actually adopt her. No, he just is like a surrogate parent without being her actual parent, which is weird. just the worst kind of awful move. Just adopt her, you dude. Yeah, you, just you dude. Do it. You dude. Even if you don't do the technical paperwork because it's olden times in the West and no one cares, just say she's your daughter. Yeah. But he doesn't. No. He doesn't. He treats her like his daughter, but he doesn't actually claim her as his daughter. And everyone in town... Knows this. Yeah, and, and they're like... And painfully shows it off. Yeah, they're like, oh, it's so kind of you to treat her like your daughter, even though she's not. And obviously, the movie's trying to paint it as if Justin's being a real stand-up guy. Mm-hmm. And the townsfolk are the ones who are really bigoted and racist and are only wanting Justin's pants. Yeah, not they don't really care about the girl at all. The girl, which is equally problematic, yes. Mm -hmm. But Justin not actually adopting her... Is still a problem. Yeah, it's still like, why? Why are you not just do it? Yeah. And then, the bigger problem with Stormy, though... Okay. One, she's... Very, very caricatured. Mm hmm. Which is she a problem. She speaks in broken English the whole time. Yes, she she most certainly does. Oh, and the, so this is a Chinese little girl yes. who dresses is in very stereotypical Chinese clothes for no reason other than to establish that she's Chinese. Mm hmm. And then she uses Japanese terminology. <laughs> Mr. Hawkins are not really angry. Him like sorry very much, I think. Because the creators of this movie couldn't be bothered to figure out what the Chinese and between. Japanese differences are. She's calling people Justin San and Sorry Chan. Sorry Chan. And stuff like that, which are Japanese terms. <laughs> Oof! It's painful. And 
To give the movie some credit, they did actually hire a Chinese American actress to play her. But I'm guessing the she Chinese... She had no control over her own script. Right. Because... I'm or sure she... was way too young to, mm -hmm. like, realize what she was doing. Because I, I don't know when she was in this movie, because who knows? You know, it could have been an older woman playing someone younger, or it could have been a, an actual girl playing the part. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But from reading her Wikipedia page, I want to... Uh, just find her. It's Barbara Jean Wong. Um, and let's see. Let's see. Okay, she was born March... 1924. 1924. So she was... So she was definitely... She was like 21 when yeah. this movie came out. Okay, so she okay. Was, she was adult yeah. when she was making this movie. Yeah. But... She probably had absolutely no control over the movie. Yeah. Um, just knowing the but times just looking and looking at her... her race and sex. Oh, okay, okay. This makes a bit more sense, just looking at the first few paragraphs of her Wikipedia page. Um, it says, Wong was a fourth generation Chinese American born in Los Angeles, California. Um, and then she began her performance career at the age of five as she could read and had a clear voice and was soon dubbed the Chinese American Shirley Temple because of her long black hair curled into ringlets and her charming persona. All right. So there's that. And yeah. I'm going to blame the creators, not her. Yes, yeah, same. Uh... I just think, like, I think the film was trying to be culturally sensitive, so I want to give it points, and yet they but act, they missed. did, like, literal zero research into the topic. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it loses all of those points and then some. Yeah, it's like, oh, we're going to try to be culturally sensitive in the way of, oh, there's a Chinese character in this movie. What? They're not speaking like a Chinese person would? Whatever. We did it. Close enough. She got the slanty eyes and the clothes. We're good. Oh, no, you're not. No, you're not. <sighs> you're really, really not. Something else I want to talk about this movie. Uh-huh. Art direction. Oh, boy. <laughs> or lack thereof. thereof. Man, I thought we were over this. Wrote a half rotoscoped, half not thing. <sighs> Every single human in this town looks like a cartoon character, except for Justin. Mr. Justin Eagle, who looks like a rotoscope, handsome, beautiful man. He is actually a head taller than every single other character he <laughs> yeah. interacts with because they're all cartoons uh -huh. with cartoon proportions. Yeah. Except for himself. It's yep. really jarring, and he does not belong. Well, honestly, almost every single character design... I would say, okay, almost every character design, you would almost say point at it and go, that's from a different movie, and that's from a different movie, and that's from a different movie. Oh, and the animals don't fit either. Yeah, I would say that Sorry and the dog and the skunk all kind of feel like they're from the same movie. Okay. But, like... Every, like, the horses feel like they come from a different movie. <laughs> Justin feels like he comes from a different movie. The townsfolk feel like they come from a different movie. Sorry, Sorry and the er, pigeon er, feel like they could go together. Yeah, and then uh, uh, Stormy is... <laughs> Honestly, I think Stormy could have fit into the same universe as Justin Eagle. But it's only because she's a child. Okay. I'm willing to give you that. Yeah, but she does not fit with, like, Justin, Sorry, and Stormy do not all three go together. And, and they're the three leads. And then leads you fit in. in question, in quotation marks, because yeah. the horses take up a big chunk of this film. Yeah, and then you add in the dog and the skunk who are always there too, and they do not fit. Mm -mm. Like, these are heavily cartoon animals. And, and the like, background. Okay, wait. We need. There's another thing we need to talk about. The layout for this movie is atrocious. Let's always go to the left. 
The backgrounds are nice. Like the background paintings are really nice. I mm -hmm. think they do a great job. However, whoever was painting the backgrounds and whoever was animating, they were not communicating with each other. They there was three... no one in between that process because sometimes there's just scenes where they put a background where obviously someone painted a background and they're like, oh, we don't need that scene anymore. Or the animator's like, wait, why'd you paint it at this angle? I thought we were gonna do it at this angle. And they just put the animation over it anyway because that's what they had. And so nothing meshes. <laughs> oh yeah, it's definitely the kind of thing where it feels like it was made with a TV budget in mind of, all right, we're going to, like everything that is drawn or animated has to be at one of these two or three angles and you have to stick to it like the background artists you have straight on to the side and like a weird from the top angle thing that look which just it looks bad all the time <laughs> um and the animators have the exact same thing mm -hmm. straight from the front to the side and every single time they travel anywhere, they go to the left. And this is just bad filming. Mm -hmm. It, It's a study that if you show things traveling to the left as compared to the right, it feels off or wrong. So if you want your characters to seem like good people and correct in their line of action, Go to the right. This is just like general information out there. Yeah. If but you instead, want a they villain the or whole film going left, and you're like, why? Why though? Why? Just go right. Just go right. Cause just you, once, please. If you want your character to feel like they're the correct person or the lead, go to the right. If you want them to the scene to feel wrong or they're evil, have them go to the left, or they're making a poor life choice or something, go to the left. It feels wrong. Mm -hmm. It's really simple. And I don't think film has necessarily figured that out at this point. Obviously, well, the these least, guys haven't. Yeah, this studio hasn't. <sighs> so, <laughs> I don't know if there's a whole lot more else we have to say about this film. Mm -hmm. But there is something I, I wanted to bring up and it's something you talked about last week. Okay. Um, you said last week when we were talking about uh, Gulliver Travels Beyond the Moon. Yes. That you felt toy animation is making films now. I didn't like, use like, those terms. Well, but. yeah, yeah. Is making, is making, like they're, they're, they've made it. They're They've making movies, like they actual feel like, movies. They feel like they're on the same level as Disney as compared to no other studios yet have done that. Right. And, and what? And now that I've had a chance to think about that, mm -hmm. I kind of wanted to... Elaborate a little bit more? To talk about that a little bit more. Because this is a good comparison film. Right. Because, because I think you're right. I think there's a difference between making a film and making an hour and a half long cartoon. Yes. And please note, when we say a cartoon, we don't mean that in a disparaging form. No, not at all. That's that's the thing I want to make very clear. I, I think there should be more respect for hour and a half long cartoons. You know, I, I don't think there is anything wrong with that. I hate the, the idea that a oh, lot of people... Oh, it's just a cartoon. I hate that. I hate that so much. So And just dismiss it offhand because right. of that term. So when we say that there's a difference between film and cartoons, don't take that to mean there is a difference between being good and being bad. That's not what we're saying. That's not what we're saying. We're just saying that they are two separate things. Mm -hmm. And this, this film is, a two, is, a, is an hour and a half long cartoon. It's yes. not a film. And that's fine, I mean, but it's, it's a bad cartoon. It's just a bad cartoon. Right. A good cartoon would be Yogi Bear. Yeah, Yogi Bear was, was a, a good, good hour and a half cartoon. cartoon. Disney, for the most part, has been making <laughs> Good films. films. Yeah. Uh, or just films, yeah. whether they're good or not, you know, we talk about during mm -hmm. the review, although most of the time we say 
they're good. When they do stuff like the Three Caballeros, that is a cartoon, mm -hmm. not a film, you know? Yeah. And, and there's not always an uh, easy distinction between what is a film and what is a cartoon. The Sword and the Stone. It could be either. It could be either. It's I, so segmented, you could count it as one or the other. And the there is no conclusion, really? Well, okay, I was I was thinking about it a lot today. And what? I was trying... Again, this How is going to be extremely this? subjective. Mm -hmm. But the best thing I could think of to differentiate between being a film and being a cartoon is if by the time you get to the end of the movie, it would feel wrong for the story to continue. Yeah. If it's a cartoon, it should feel like the story could keep going forever. You could just keep telling more stories and do more things in this universe. Right. If it's a film, the story is done. ends. Yeah. And I don't to, care if there's a sequel down the line. Right. The story that they're telling right now is complete. And that has a lot to do... And then I was thinking about it some more, and I was like, well, but why would that be? Because um, I love Character thinking... Arcs. And I love thinking about this kind of stuff. So, yeah, I was like, well, okay, but, but why, why do I feel that way? So then I was thinking it's because the themes have to be on point mm -hmm. and the character arcs have to be on point. And if you feel like a character has gone through a complete arc or the story has gone through a complete arc. Because if characters don't a always go in, go in arcs. Right. And, and if we've, if the story has like a solid theme, then, then it wraps up by the end of the movie and that's a film. But if it doesn't do that, you know, then you're like, oh, well, these characters still have room to grow, so this should be serialized, and it should be more like a cartoon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. And I yet mean, again, that's never always going to be the case. Yeah. But... It's, it's, uh, it's a way for us to, like, do some super generic classification here. Mm -hmm. And by no means is this meaning we're only going to be watching one or the other going forward or anything like that. No, no. I just think that because because the animation community in general, I feel like, okay, we're, we're going to kind of go on another bigger, broader subject. Okay. I want to say that I feel fairly confident in saying that there is a lot of animation critics out there that don't know a thing about animation. Yes. And they, they critique animation, and I think that's fine. I think everybody's allowed to critique animation. Um, but... There's there's always this talk of, you know, whether or not animation should just be limited to cartoony stuff, whether animation can be do realistic stuff. And I think that conversation's just bullshit. Mhm. Mm animation can be whatever. It can be both. It can be quite literally anything it wants to be. It's animation. It's animation. It's if you can draw it you can do it. Or, you know, make Anim 3D models of it or make puppets of it. You can do it. Like, like animation is pretty limitless when it comes to film. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why every studio in Hollywood is using animation these days. That um, movie you just saw, that blockbuster, it had animation in it. Yeah, I, I mean, animation's amazing. That's, that's why... That's why we're doing this. That's why we're doing this. <laughs> um... So yeah, and I feel like people get stuck thinking that animation should be like more cartoony or should be more realistic. And I want to have a distinction between the two, sure, but be able to talk about them both positively. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, that was a long ramble, but I feel like it needed to be said. Yeah. I hope I made some kind of point what are your thoughts on that subject? Yeah, let us know. On this episode that I don't even know how many people are going to watch this one. I don't know. 
it's, it's not man, a Disney episode. It's the man from Button Willow. <laughs> you know, that childhood classic everyone knows about. <laughs> that no one can find any information about. Yeah, that there is like a whole oh, that's something sentence to bring up. written about on Wikipedia. I've never seen any other westerns. Oh, yeah. That's something we didn't actually talk, talk about. about. <laughs> it probably doesn't need to be talked about for very long, but... I mean, to be honest, my experiences with westerns are also very, very small. I've seen, like, a John Wayne movie, um, and I... I don't remember what it is. It's the one where all the boys die. If anyone knows a Western, they probably know what one I'm talking about, but it, it's sad at the end. That's all I remember from that one. Um, okay. I've seen the man from Stormy River, and the only thing I remember from that is when the guy's riding his horse down a 90 degree slope, because that's the only memorable part of that movie. Um, and my family was, like, creaming their pants because, oh, my gosh, he's such a good writer. Uh, and then I've seen Tombstone? Does that count as a Western? I have no idea. It's been a, it's been a really long time since I've seen any of these films, though. And you've seen Blazing Saddles, which is a parody of Western movies. <laughs> Yeah, but that means it was a comedy. Yeah, so it's not, like, really a Western. I only saw that once in uh, high school years ago. Oh, man, Blazing Saddles is so good, though. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much my experience with Westerns. And I guess Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron is, like, Western adjacent. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. Um, but... In my experience, a lot of westerns are kind of just about living the fantasy of being a cowboy. So nothing really happens. Oh, I've also seen parts of The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Which is also, it is, which is like actually supposed to be a pretty good film. But I think I fell asleep while I was watching it, so. Okay. So, we're uncultured swine when it comes to, it comes westerns, to westerns, okay? I'm just going to say that, you know, the western died for a reason. Ha! And, and that reason was because, you know, films being centered around the magical idea of being a cowboy can only get you so far. And then when you just, you know, add the reality of, like, being a cowboy wasn't all that great, and if you weren't a white person being a cowboy, life was pretty shit. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, all right, well, let's move on to the next movie, then. Yeah, yeah, speaking of the next movie. Uh, uh, we have another American film, Willie McBean and His Magic Machine. We got some stop motion up in here. We do. We're coming for you, Rankin Bass. We've got to show the old scarecrow there ain't the thing to fear. We have to make the cornstalk learn to wash behind his ear. We have to tame the wild, wild oats and teach a tree to bark and take the little primrose out on the mantle arc. By golly, we got a lot of work.